Okay. Uh, so yeah, so so this is the ring that board. Um, so as the as the helpful diagram here illustrates, um, five bit data comes in, which is noise shaped at two meg or six meg actually, two point eight meg, six meg. Um, that comes up through here. So what happens then is is that that five bit code goes into the, each FPGA sort of stereo. Um, the job of, of, of these is to basically decide which latches to turn on. So the, the ring DAC is, a, is, a, is what's called a thermometer DAC. Um, so these latches are all the same size in terms of current. Um, so if you think of a ladder DAC, um, then each, each current source is, is twice the size of the previous one. So 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. So what, what we do with the thermometer DAC instead is that if we have, like, say, a code of 7 going up from the, from the, from the noise shaper, we literally turn on seven current sources, right? The current sources basically get summed and fed through the analog filter stage. Uh, so the, the, the key thing what you want to do is basically you want to separate out that code seven from any particular seven current sources, right? So with a, with a, with a ladder deck, if you say seven, then you have one, two, and four are on, and those four are always on. So the error between those will be the same every time you get a seven. Now, what the mapper does is basically every every three or six meg, you turn on a different seven, and so what that what that in effect does is that any mismatches you have between current sources, because we live in the real world, so you know as as temperature changes, as the things age, these will actually not be quite the same as each other. So what what you want to do is separate out that error from the signal that causes it. So it's called, it's called a decorrelated deck is is a technique. And so what you want to do is, is basically anything that's correlated will, will turn up as, as distortion, right? So distortion is, is harmonics. And harmonics are related to the signal, and harmonics are the things that let you tell the difference between, say, a, a violin and a piano. They're all, you have the fundamental tones and the harmonics. So what you want to do is get rid of any harmonics that aren't actually there originally. Get rid of them. You don't want them. And so what the ring neck does is that uh, we actually trade off slightly a bit of, a bit of noise performance because because we have to, this theoretical seven code, um, we're always turning on a different seven. Turning things off and on makes, makes noise. The faster you do it, the more noise you get. But the spectrum of that noise, if you do it properly, is nice and white. And your, your ear-brain mechanism is spectacularly good at removing noise, white noise. Uh, the topology is pretty well unique. Uh, I don't believe anybody else is using anything quite like this. There's no binary weighting, uh, there's no R2R ladder, anything like that. Uh, it is unity weighted throughout, and that means that we can do some very clever things uh, with swapping the, the data lines around to scramble any errors. The advantage of this is that you can uh, deal with any inaccuracies in the components, which obviously will not be perfectly matched, and scrambling tends to turn any small errors uh, from what would be distortion creating processes into a small amount of extra noise. So it is, uh, it's a very cunning circuit which has served us well since Hi, about what, 1989. Uh, this for example is a Vivaldi upsampler and as you can see here the uh, the big board at the bottom is the digital processing board which is common to the, the whole Vivaldi range. And this is the, the sort of basic structure that we try to maintain. The digital board is basically like a sort of digital audio PC. So it has all of the infrastructure that you need to do almost any uh, digital audio type task. Uh, but it doesn't really do anything at all until you load some software into it. It's fully programmable. Uh, the advantage of, of using the same board over and over again in different products uh, is obviously you get used to its quirks, you know how to program it, you get experience in using it, and then you get very good at, uh, at designing the software. Uh, soak everything that we make for four days. So it's put in the rack down there, it's powered up, the power is switched on and off, um, we lock it to a source which changes sample rate from time to time just to exercise all the circuitry. Uh, and then the next stage after that, once it's uh, quite happily passed, is to put it on auto test. So uh, we've used the, the, the FFT technology that uh, we've, we learned from that to produce these test stations. The reason we really had to do this is because 
it's not all that widely known perhaps that uh, DCS has been a pioneer of high sample rate. Uh, we were the first to offer 24-bit devices back in 1989. We were the first to go to 2496, which was back around 1994. Uh, a few years later, we were the first to 24192. Then the year after that, we, uh, we helped Sony and Philips develop the SACD by providing them with some Elgar units and some Pro units which could work with DSD. I believe we were also the first to DXD 24352.8 and over the years we have developed a lot of special interfaces, many of which have been incorporated into uh, international standards. So for example, dual AES is in common use at the, the top end, has the advantage of lower jitter over single wire. We also invented DOP back in 2011. Uh, the, the downside of doing things like that is the commercial test equipment is no use to you, so you have to design your own. So what we have here is three, maybe four boxes. You have a, a test generator which can be programmed by the computer to generate a variety of test signals. Uh, we have uh, a, an A to D converter which is of course ring DAC based uh, which will convert uh, the analog data from a, a DAC or a player back to digital and this is a computer interface box. The whole thing is run by this array of computers um, and a typical test sequence for a DAC would take something like one and a half hours. And that's a lot of computer time. So we can generate a huge amount of data during that time, check it against limits and make sure that everything's working as we would expect. Something like an upsampler I think takes more like three hours because there are just so many more combinations to test. Um, and we'd start off with normally the, the guy who built it uh, and then the second inspection would be by somebody else from production and the third inspection would be from somebody from sales and marketing. And if we all agree that it's perfect, uh, then it can be packed and shipped.